to joining uh, this evening. This is Aura's first In Conversation, um, where we'll be discussing art, spaces, geographies, and we've got together a brilliant panel. Um, we have the honor of having with us Gerhard Marx, um, who is an artist who's on display in Aura, um, who's based in South Africa. Um, we have Bianca Chu, who is an incredible independent curator and consultant. And you've got Mukami Kuria, who is making all kinds of things happen in the art world, but beyond. It is the co-founder of The Gathering, based between um, Nairobi and London. Um, and I myself, um, I'm, I'm Jen. I'm Jen Ellis. I am the co-founder of uh, Aura. And... I'm a curator amongst other things. Um, so first of all, hi everyone, thank you. Um, I thought that we could kickstart by maybe just briefly giving a little introduction about Aura and then each of our individual panelists before handing over to them because frankly, we're more interested to hear <laughs> from them what they have to say. Um, so Aura is a virtual space and platform um, that was co-founded by myself and Benny Allen, who's here with us tonight, um, who is an incredible architect. And it seeks through combining in a curated manner art, architecture and music to instill a sense of calm and well-being. So you've got on the one hand this virtual space, which we've created from scratch um, and curated along different tenets of what calm and well-being can look and feel like. So in hall number one, we're thinking about landscape, which is where Gerhard's work is located. Um, and alongside this virtual space, we have a whole series of events trying to get people from all over the world um, to engage with the core tenets that we're trying to communicate and make people feel. Um, so this is Exchange, this is one of those events. Um, and we're just so excited for you to all be with us here tonight. So Gerhard, as I mentioned beforehand, is an artist who is from South Africa. And I actually first came across Gerhard's work right before lockdown. I went to Goodman Gallery in London and I was taken to a side back room and I was struck by this piece, Antaeus in Midair, which is on display um, in the space. And it was his use of maps, cartography, collage, blending different reference points, but also creating our own space. And I was saying to Gerhard yesterday, you got this sense of working in two, but also three dimensions. And as being a mega nerd and obsessed with maps, I was completely drawn to it. And I was like, wow, we've got to include it. Um, and then Bianca and I first came across each other when uh, Bianca was director and leading a whole bunch of incredible curatorial projects um, at S2, which is a gallery funded by Sotheby's. But Bianca has decade of experience in the art world, working in like, private and public sector, and is now lending her wonderful strategic brain over to Procreate that's supporting women artists who are also mothers. Um, so incredible to have you with us. And Mukami and I, um, we met through uh, fellow art world friends. Um, it was originally through my interest in, in Nkai, which is the Nairobi Contemporary Art Institute. And they're like, well, you've got to meet Mukami. And I'm like, okay, okay, okay. Met Mukami and it's like, oh, just like the co-founder of The Gathering, which are these incredible series of um, lectures, events, bringing together artists primarily from you know, the African region and also, I have to say, Mokami is also training as a barrister and doing all kinds of other things on the side. So that's what I have to say about them. But I would like, without further ado, to invite um, each one of them to introduce themselves. So, Gerhard, over to you. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My, so my name is Gerhard Marx. I'm incredibly excited that my work uh, that my work forms part of Aura, and it's a real privilege to to see my work there. Um, I think more so because these sort of connections happen during lockdown. And, and so it, it's been really satisfying to suddenly the moment, uh, I suppose it felt that the world became incredibly constrained. It, it also felt like it was opening up on, on other levels. And I, and I already certainly felt like one of those things where suddenly other possibilities were, were made, were enabled um, through through this sort of strange time that we found ourselves in. 
So I'm an artist. I've been um, working in a variety of, of media um, over the years, but, but, but certainly one thing that's been constant has been my engagement with cartographies and maps. And it started with a simple moment where I realized that, uh, uh, where I realized that I could, I could engage with these sort of pseudoscientific objects with the sort of official languages that maps present, but by cutting them and, and simply sort of cutting them and, and, and and, and fragmenting them and collaging them, I could restructure them. And, and so in a sense, I could find a sort of subjective voice using and manipulating and engaging with these sort of official voices and these sort of power structures that, that these sort of scientific uh, objects offer. I could somehow sort of find a sort of poetic space within it. And I think that sort of defines my practice is that it, I, I tend to develop methods or, or uh, sort of techniques that enables me to engage with a sort of field. And, and once I've enabled the technique, I can explore that field for its sort of philosophical or poetic potential. So, so it's an explorative practice that's a, a, a very much about the practice. It's very much about sort of engaging and questioning and, 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 and exploring in, in, in those sort of ways. Incredible, thank you. Bianca? <laughs> Hi everyone, um, uh, so my name is Bianca Chu and as Jen said, I'm a curator and consultant, normally based in London, but today I'm zooming in from Lisbon where I've been for a couple of weeks. Um, uh, so, uh, as I mentioned, the Procreate Project, it's a nonprofit um, pioneering social enterprise organization aimed at supporting artists who are mothers. So at Procreate, we have many initiatives, which include the Mother Art Prize, uh, the Mother House, which is artist studios with childcare, and most recently, we're currently in the midst of awarding a grant of £10,000 to 10 artists for a new work. Um, I also advise the estate of uh, Kim Lim, who is an artist um, who passed away in 97 a Singaporean Chinese artist who came to Britain in the 50s, um, working with her sons who are the custodians of the estate. Um, and uh, just a bit of interesting news, the Tate Britain will be mounting a collection display of her work this September. Um, so as Jen said, prior to that, I was the deputy director of S2, which is the exhibition arm of Sotheby's um, here in, Lon oh, in London. Um, and our program primarily focused on sort of marginalized narratives within recent art discourse. So using the platform of, of, the, of the auction house, we aimed to bring more visibility on the secondary market um, and also within the greater art ecosystem, these kinds of stories. Um, and we did it with, um, by engaging in kind of a transparent collaboration with um, estates, artists, their galleries, private collectors, dealers, and so forth. Um, and my own research kind of continues to center around this pervasive notion of marginalization occurring within art history, especially recent art history. Um, and some of the artists we exhibited at S2 were um, artists like Li Wen Jia, Kim Lim, uh, Renata Bertelman, Alfredo Volpi, Yuko Nasaka, uh, Biche Lazzari, just to, to name a few. Um, and, uh, and for me, today's kind of topic and today's talk and speaking with Gerhard and Mukami and, and Jan about the crossroads of um, art spaces and geographies is incredibly relevant. Um, uh, we kind of mentioned already, but our entire existence for most of this year has, since COVID, has been focused on the sort of private or the individual or the isolated space um, versus any kind of public space. And our experience of geographies themselves have been, you know, heavily reduced. Um, and yet, kind of geography being the study of people in their environments feels like an incredible kind of field of study to be dipping into right now. Um, and in particular, in relation to Aora as a new virtual platform and to Gary her own artistic practice. So I'm really happy to be here. Thank you so much. Amazing. Mukami. Cool. Um, thank you so much for giving all of us this platform then. Um, and I'm looking forward to the rest of the presentation. Um, so I'm Mukami Korea. I'm currently sat in London, but I was born in Nairobi and spent time between both cities. Uh, I wear very many hats. Um, yeah. I am um, the co-founder of The Gathering, um, which is a platform uh, founded by Michael Armitage and myself, 
uh, created between created in 2016 and taking place in 2017 in Naivasha, Kenya. And the gathering is a symposium for African artists. So we brought together 52 artists from 12 different countries in Africa and the diaspora. Um, and the ethos of the gathering, for, I think for both of us, came out of wanting to have um, what now feels like a very distant possibility, but, but at that time wanting to have a physical meeting of, of artists to outside of the dominant networks of, of how we think of the art world. So creating spaces outside of art fairs, outside of galleries, creating independent space for artists to think about their positionalities and think about how they approach their practices, think about how they approach um, various issues that exist within the arts ecosystem in Africa. Um, so things like arts education or working within or circumventing, um, you know, the various uh, issues that exist with, with institutions um, around the continent. Um, and from that, what we had hoped was to see, you know, artists creating their own networks of support. Um, and what we did see was people coming together and, and creating, you know, studio exchanges and mentorships um, and collaborations. Um, and from that, um, the energy behind uh, the gathering has sort of spurred Michael towards founding um, NKI, which is a new initiative in Nairobi um, created to display and, and, and document and archive sort of the history of the expansive history of Kenyan art, um, which also involves working with different institutions uh, in, in Germany, for example, on uh, shows that are coming up. So a lot of modern Kenyan art sits in a number of German collections. And so beginning to think about how to create this constellation of of collaboration in order to ensure that this work is shown in Kenya, if not at least bought by Kenyan institutions. Um, and, and from that, I think more generally thinking about the role of the artist in transforming place, which is a conversation that started at the gathering where we invited Theastigates uh, to speak about his own practice uh, on the Sunday of the gathering. And he spoke to an audience of, he spoke to, he spoke to, uh, the audience of a gathering and in addition to art students and architecture students uh, and was also on a panel with architects and urban planners and that's that's another world that I spend a lot of time uh, embedded in, in in terms of thinking about you know cities and zoning and and the right to belonging and and who has the right to place and space mm -hmm. um, and so that leads me on to thinking about my lawyer hat which again opens up a very <laughs> interesting conversation with Gerhard's work um, in terms of thinking about the specificity of boundaries and of cartographies and the ways in which um, there's so much meaning and significance attached to certainty, whereas his work opens up this entire language um, of, of subjectivity and uncertainty using these, these ways in which we know the world through maps. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to the rest of the conversation. Yeah, that's amazing. And I think how it's interesting how all three of you Include and then including myself, four of us, and with Benny, five, um, we're approaching this idea of art spaces and geographies in such different ways. So, you know, I will say that from my standpoint, you know, when curating Aura, I was thinking about artworks in it that had a sense of feeling um, as opposed to ticking off certain art historical tenets. Um, and then when thinking about spaces, we wanted a space that was accessible to all. So all, anywhere in the world, you can access it if you have an internet connection. And that for me is a real thrill. And thinking about geographies, it was sort of transcending them and then bringing people together from different geographies, from different hemispheres all together. I mean, here this evening by UK standards, I mean, we're connecting US, different parts of Africa, um, different parts of Europe. And that is the way I've been thinking about art spaces and geographies. But I would love to hear from each one of you what that sparks when you say art spaces and geographies. Um, over to you, maybe Gerhard, we start with you. I, I think maybe a logical place to start would be with, with the work that you selected. Absolutely, uh, in yeah. <laughs> I, I, I thought it was such a fascinating thing that you selected that work and that that, that, that work uh, came to your attention at this point. Uh, the reference there is Antaeus, who um, in Greek mythology is the son of Gaia. And Antaeus um, wrestles 
anyone that crosses his path down to earth and sort of pins them down and, and, and suffocates them by pinning them down to earth. So Hercules has to pass uh, Antaeus as, as, as one of his tasks. And so Hercules figures out that the way to, circum to, 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 the way to sort of win Antaeus is by lifting him off the ground so, to, so that he loses his connection to, the, to, to, to earth. Um, and he, he, he then suffocates him in, in the air. And that drawing um, sort of references that logic by throwing together a complexity of, of geographies. And, and I think what's interesting also is that with maps always comes a reference to time. There, there's yeah. an abundance of dating um, that happens on maps. And whether it's the, the dating that happens by the cartographer or when the information was gathered or when it was, was sort of um, absorbed into the archive or re-archive, all of those sort of dates come into play. So, so, so by throwing all those sort of fragments and things together, um, uh, y you create this sort of hybridity of, of I suppose, both time and, and space. And one that. of the things yeah. that's been interesting to me about working with the maps is that is that a map wants to give you a sense of groundedness, right? It gives you an aerial view that looks down on the earth and, and gives you this sort of flat, perspectiveless view onto earth, which is essentially sort of the, a view of power. And, 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 and one of the things I've been exploring in, in, in my work with maps is how do I break that sense of groundedness? And, and, and one of the logics in that has been to work with this illusion of transparency. And so, and so, so, so by reconstructing the map so that they overlap and, and become transparent and, and, and that you lose a clear sense of what the surface is where your eye falls, you, you open up the sense of, I suppose, essentially creating a cartography of groundlessness. Um, a, a, a sort of cartography of vertigo and, and a sense of, I suppose, a cartography of uncertainty. And so really this, that work was about um, working against the impulse to find and an impulse towards groundedness. And, and all the sort of senses of na nationalisms and all those sort of fictions that comes with um, certainties and boundaries and those sort of things. And instead steering the cartography towards a space of uncertainty into, in, 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 mm. into sort of spaces of complexity. Um, and so, yeah, so, so, so I suppose in terms of geography and, 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 and groundedness and things like that. And then it's beautiful that in this time, this sort of mo COVID moment where we were all sort of pinned to the ground, you would find the <laughs> Antaeus in midair um, and, <laughs> as, as a cartography at that point. Yeah. It was you know, very ironic, but also I should say, um, for those who have visited the space, you will recognize it, but for those who haven't, you know, the placement of it, it's really the second work you encounter. And I like this idea that it informed without really informing, it informed without guiding you how to access and navigate this space, this new space. Um, so that was, that was the logic. Um, behind it. But Bianca, what do you, what, what do you think? <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, I have to say, I um, kind of picking on the thread of this idea that of groundedness and, and time and dating, I, when I was kind of preparing for this talk and getting to know Gerhard's work a bit more in depth, um, I was immediately reminded of two books. And, and, and the first book that um, came to mind was a book I read recently um, called, uh, by Rebecca Solnit called The Field Guide to Getting Lost. Mm -hmm. um, and, and looking at Gerhard's work, which incorporates this kind of visual language of maps, I couldn't help but um, uh, call to mind moments when maps were most needed. So when we're lost, when we're searching for something and 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 this idea of quote getting lost quote getting lost you know today i think is a wonderful sentiment because since with all the new technologies of you know google maps google earth ways etc we we kind of rarely find ourselves lost in the classic sense of the word um and then and maps have also become tools that are easily accessible and we kind of accept their authority without question um, 
and then you know the, this concept of a sense of place being prevalent right now because of you know lockdown having you know up until it's been eased up we haven't been able to sort of leave or abscond from a set place for many months and 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 many people i know have spent their lockdown sort of daydreaming or lost in books like me or podcasts or other kind of spaces where they can transport themselves um or participate in the form of escapism and i think you know this idea of a map being able to allow you a way into that kind of internal journey is incredibly provocative and emotive and and um and and worth kind of examining more in depth um in solnit's book she kind of discusses the first ever first few maps ever made and these were by uh, a man named Walter C. Muller, who is a german cartographer um, um, and you know, in his um, 1513 plate, the, the, this, his atlas depicts central, the Central Atlantic, Spain, um, the Western bulge of Africa. But then, on the right, upper right hand of South America, there's nothing but a coastline, and it says, in you know, terra incognita, which essentially means unknown land. Um, and and I found that really interesting that as late as sort of 1900, maps still included this concept or phrase for unknown lands. It, it was a, this inclusion was pointing to kind of a, a recognition and a humility of knowledge um, mm. on the, in, in the capacity of the cartographers, which where they were admitting, you know, we, there are things that we don't know. Mm -hmm. um, and today, obviously, that's kind of very seldom ever found, you know, that we, we have mapped all of Earth, you know, to, to some extent, and, and we no longer include this reference to, you know, having a limited scope of knowledge or admitting that we might have some, you know, empty pockets of knowledge. Um, and, and to acknowledge the unknown, I think, is, is, is part of being knowledgeable. And, um, and I think she, she, you know, so Rebecca really, ta so really talks about this in her book. And I thought that tied really succinctly to um, the experience of Garrett's work, because you know, such as um, works like the Transparent Territories that he was just talking about, because rather than sort of unknown lands or terra incognitas, we're sort of experiencing and delving into his imaginary lands or terra imaginarium, kind of <laughs> these incredible spaces which don't exist in real life, but allow us to question real issues or experiences or philosophical questions that we have. Um, and, and maps being, um, so intrinsically tied to our cultural experiences as well. So cultural experiences of places um, and as well as being inherent systems or of power. So, you know, a representation is never fully complete. Um, and yet in Gerhard's work, there's a sort of lack of hierarchy and a dismantling or disappearing of systems of power, um, whether it be social or political, which I find incredibly interesting. Um, and so a map in Gerhard's work is therefore not a map to tell you where you are, but um, or what is ahead or behind you, but rather a map for an internal journey, you know, yeah. a questioning, um, which I think is so incredibly necessary and relevant right now. Completely. I think that that, that sense of internal journey is, um, that deeply resonates, it deeply resonates with me. Um, and Mukami, what about you? What do you think? So I approached this yesterday with a certain set of thoughts and then sort of slept on it and, and have now arrived at like um, <laughs> additional things that I've that. I think particularly because my my legal background is in international law and so you spend a lot of time thinking about maps and boundaries and the extent to which sort of case law is determined not only on where specific boundaries lie or where they're disputed um, but also thinking about you know forms of knowledge that existed say around the time colonization was happening so thinking about um, disputes between Cameroon and Niger, disputes between Equatorial Guinea, um, where it wasn't even just this form of, of terra incognito, but where terra nullius was an actual um, recognized legal category of saying, it's not even just un un unknown land, it's just that we simply think there's nothing there, and this therefore becomes uh, a category by which you can then lay claim to land. Um, I think something else that's really interesting that's been happening in the last couple of weeks in terms of everything on, going on in the world um, has been watching people have this conversation online about the violence of Mercator projections, right? And thinking about um, how it is in, in which certain representations have been made to distort how certain places look in order to then project power. 
Um, and so for me, I think that's, that, that was a, a fascinating way of, of, of entering Gerhard's work as both a lawyer and someone who looks at things a lot. Um, and, and looking at the collapsing of that official language um, and, and creating this emotional journey of, of looking at, at lines and boundaries and, and, and the ways in which we can distort them to, to decontextualize them and, and say, you know, the, in his work, they don't have to have the meaning that we ascribe to them collectively or, or ascribe to them and attach power to them. Um, and, and in that regard, I was reading this essay that Sean O'Toole wrote, and I absolutely loved Sean, and he said, um, about your work, that maps are tacit exercises in incompletion, assertions whose half-truths and best attempts are always negotiable. Um, and I've been thinking about that a lot in terms of, uh, more generally, how one negotiates space and boundaries, how one negotiates um, access to the city, uh, which, which ties into the gathering conceptually and the work that Nkai is trying to do um, I think something that you picked up on, Jen, uh, was how the gathering negotiates conceptualizing diaspora um, and, and what it means to be uh, engaging with the African continent from an African diaspora. Um, and more generally thinking about, you know, Gerhard's work, Transparent Territory, the ways in which global modernity um, is imbued with this cartography that, that leaks across, you know, the Indian Ocean, across the Atlantic, um, and thinking of, say, Glissant and the relationship between transparency and opacity. Mm. Um, for us, I think, it, like, inviting artists from the African diaspora uh, to a space like The Gathering, I think, was important, but there was also a lot of tensions and frictions that emerged within that, right? Where you're saying that you're grounded in your positionalities from elsewhere, but what do we have in common? What does it mean to be an African artist living and practicing in Africa? And what does it mean to be um, an artist in the in the diaspora, um, and how far conceptually do we stretch what it means to be a diaspora artist, right? So we'd have, say, someone who's half the Wandis but lives in America versus having an African-American artist present, like, what are the concerns they come with? How do they approach that positionality and subjectivity? Um, so I think having done one iteration of The Gathering, I think our understanding of cartographies and end of diaspora end of that relationship is is not exactly nothing was resolved but i think it opened up um a number of interesting conversations and also space for disjuncture for saying it's okay that we don't think about race yeah. for example in the same way or race yeah. like an everyday everyday feature or, or you know a thing that people think about if you're an ethiopian artist for example um yeah and that and, and I, I think yeah. oh go for it yeah, just two thoughts that I'd love to add to that is, um, f firstly, I, I think there's, there's a beautiful sense in geography that where they talk about the geographic turn, which is essentially uh, geography kind of makes us up to a point, and then we start creating a, the world around us, or, or the sort of man-made world proliferates to, to, to such an extent that we kind of make geography. And that there's that turning that happens where, where geography, we're not simply uh, the product of geography, but geography is also the product of, of, of man. Mm. And there's that sort of relationship. And I think there's a similar turning that happens in image making. And, and so, so, so um, and I'm speaking back to this sort of terra incognito idea where you're taking a complexity, albeit the world, and you find a way of simplifying that information through, say, cartography. Um, and so you find a metaphor or visual narrative with which you can simplify things and communicate things. But, but then there's a point where that visual metaphor becomes the constraint. And so, so there's a turning that happens there where, whereby the map becomes the constraint and the, the, the language that you use to communicate things becomes the simplification. And, and so there's a turning that needs to happen there. And, and I think the terra incognito now lies in other forms of mapping. So, so the complexities of maps now, now lies in things like over-surveillance and, mm. and, 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 
and and misrepresentations and things like that that happens within the map. So from the colonial impulse, it's now gone to Google Maps and there's sort of complete over surveillance. And I think the sort of contemporary news and and the sort of issues of our time is is very much concerned with with that notion of mapping. You know, the sort of absolute tracking of of individuals and things like that. Um, and now I forgot my second point. Oh, yeah, um, so interesting to say that <laughs> because um, I really, I, I, when you, when I, when you said the geographical turn, I just kept thinking of this idea of agency, you know, and whether as as agents we are creating these objects that and imbuing them with this power, and then vice versa, they are as they get passed down or or circulated through the networks of connections of you know whether that's you know. Uh, from ship to ship or you know by email it becomes they become agents in their own right and they they enact on us certain understandings certain connotations things that then as you say can uh, can can inform our decision making or our um, ideas of things and that's a, that's a very interesting kind of slippage where you're essentially you know, you're you're questioning whether you've been the one creating or you're being created, um, exactly. and that is incredibly fascinating. Mm. Yeah. So the map creates the world in the end. The world doesn't create the map. Yeah. Mm. And that sense of responsibility. I, I interrupted you. <laughs> no, no, not at all. I was just, I, I was just, I, I just, I, I spent five years in Hong Kong before moving um, to to London three years ago, and I was always just amazed by that. For example, Southeast Asia, that was a term that had been created by the Americans to encapsulate a whole geographical region, which effectively there are so many differences in terms of culture, religion, color. Like there, there's no blending, right? So this is there's a human responsibility for the creation of that particular region and the recording of it. Um, I was wondering also whether, because through our discussion, I've noticed that there's not a lot of, you, you think of a map as something clear, right? Maybe that's your first instinct, like, oh, I'm gonna go there. But actually what's emerging from our discussion is that there's a lot of duality. And maybe it's not even duality, maybe it's gray area, where there, it, there's, there's like a constant mush flux and it's moving. And I've been thinking about that in terms of you know, the existence of the real and the virtual, because obviously we've created this virtual space, which you can go visit and you are really there, you are really seeing it. And the feelings that you're feeling, the sensory points are, are real, um, but it's not of this world. And I think something that we should say that Benny and I, when we were setting out to make that space, we on purpose did not mimic reality at all. Um, we actually just created something, a figment of our imagination. So I don't know, I was interested to see, like, what do you think about this? I, there was a term that, um, that, that, that you use, Gerhard, was that, that bilocation. And mm -hmm. um, I, I, maybe we can flesh out on that a little bit, because I think it's really interesting, because I think duality is even something that we cover, we, 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 we carry it with ourselves every single day. And even, I have to say, like right now, you know, on the one hand, you're existing in this virtual world, looking at this screen, but then there's also your physical, you know, the things that I'm touching right now. So, yeah. yeah. So uh, I think it's interesting to 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 understand that the aerial viewpoint that a map offers precedes flight. So 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 maps were drawn as if seen from the air long before people could enter the sky. So long before people could physically look look down on Earth. So 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 it's a virtual space to begin with, right? Um, so a, a, a kind of a virtual mental projection. Mm. The, the bilocation is a is a religious term that that refers to be being in one place at the same time so, so uh, in two places at the same time so so that and, and i think a, a map is exactly that you are here you you're in front of a piece of paper and you're looking down onto it but at the same time you're in another location the map is there to trans to transport you into another space and I think that's something that in my work I play with a lot is the that sort of the, the illusion that it creates versus the flatness that that is the map itself. So so despite the fact that it's a drawing, it's always a, a kind of an object. There's a sort of tangible tactility to it. And I was kind of I, I was um, interested when I first visited Aura to think, you, you know, how do we construct virtual re virtual galleries? Do we need gravity in virtual galleries? <laughs> Um, you know, 
but, and at the same time, looking at your space, I was aware that you wouldn't want it to be too disorientating. You know, you wanted a sense of calm in, in your... So, so, so if you deviate from normality, um, what does that mean? And, you know, so that it doesn't become sort of too trippy or, or, or things <laughs> trippy, like that. Yeah. So, so, so it's interesting. Um, does a virtual space need gravity um, and, and those kind of things? It, it would be interesting to hear from Benny also how, how you guys approach that. Um, I mean, you've hit the nail on the head, really. Uh, I think it was really important to create a space that had a certain sense of familiarity to people because we didn't want to have uh, a space that, I guess, with the virtual world, you can create whatever you want. And, and we didn't want to make something that was too, uh, too alien. So, so things within the space, the certain size of openings, um, the way that the light falls in the room, the colors of the walls, it had to have a resemblance of rooms. And, and that was really quite important. And I think that question about whether you need gravity, in some ways you probably do because you want to be able to move through this virtual world in a, in a way that slightly resembles the experience of actually moving through it physically. Mm. So it's, it's a really interesting question and I think it's something that will continue developing because we don't really know the answer yet. We sort of by instinct developed this virtual space with lots of discussions with the virtual reality developer. And, and I think we got to somewhere which, which had the kind of balance of not doing something that wasn't too too much like trying to recreate a gallery, but also something that isn't too dissimilar to what other people might um, might associate from a space that's about displaying art. So, yeah. Yeah. Bianca, what do you think? Your thing about this? I mean, you were saying something really interesting yesterday when we were having a chat before about like the journey of the eye and also the political natures. I don't know, maybe there's other sparks that come out of there. I just, I'm just thinking of so, that. So, so I, I, the second book that I had that came to mind as I was um, kind of getting into Gerhard's work was um, a book that I, I, I um, have had for many, many years. It was a, it was, it's an encyclopedic publication called Images of the Mind written by Wen Fong, who is a scholar at Yale University. And it's like one of the kind of seminal texts about Chinese literati painting um, and and what I think people kind of misunderstand often about landscape painting um, or classic landscape painting is that it's it's both real and imaginary so um, this idea of, of bilocation being you know as Gary said being at first a religious sort of term so the idea I guess being that you would want to trans or transform people through images. Um, it's a very similar thing that happens in, in, in Chinese literati painting. So, so um, in dynastic China, scholars painted and created maps in the form of landscapes. And I think we haven't used that term yet in, in the talk, but I often, uh, I, I really do perceive Garrett's work as landscapes um, or, you know, it's kind of scapes of some kind where you are um, getting descriptions as well as representations of, of ideal places. Um, and, and, and in Chinese painting, if you can imagine like a classic scholar painting where you have a beautiful valley and a high mountain and um, this, the idea of the, the experience of a painting like this is not so much about um, the objective or true representation, but really more about the journey through this painting. So um, though the experience of, of, of realism was important to them, it was more important the notion of perspective and journeying through. So your eye going from, and your mind therefore, going from the top of a mountain peak, down a windy river, through a forest, eventually landing in a small pavilion on a hill. Maybe there's people, maybe there's no people. Um, and it was, and it's kind of, it's an interesting um, kind of, position to think about in comparison to, for example, Western art, where you have a single point perspective and your eye is drawn immediately to one center point and everything is kind of grows from out of that. Whereas in Chinese traditional painting, there is no single point perspective. It's about verticality. It's about a journey through space. Um, and, and, and not only that, 
landscape painting was was used in a political way so there was political gestures that were like kind of woven into the way um these paintings were received or commissioned or, or produced um so for example one of my favorite um painters is this art uh, uh, artist named Mizan, who was uh, living during the yuan dynasty so the mongol rulers and they were considered foreigners in the in 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 china and they i mean they were uh they were probably the the dynasty that expanded china the most um and they incorporated a lot of um tolerance and religious openness but still you know many artists reacted against the the kind of academies of the time because they felt that there was this uh, this kind of foreign invasion going on and so for example nizan would paint um entire paintings where you had no human presence and that was his way of retreating um, from kind of uh, being a literati scholar um, and and entering a, a space of Taoist meditation. Um, so this idea of, of a journey through space, through geography, being a mental and, and internal experience, again, is is something that keeps kind of coming up when I when I think about Garrett's work. Um, and then this idea of being in two places at once and speaks to our kind of unique human ability um, to be physically in one place, but perhaps um, mentally, uh, emotionally, psychologically in another. Mm. Of course, the, the, the Mubius kind of structure of Antaeus in mid-air also references the sort of Buddhist knot. And, and so there is that idea that your eye can just sort of journey onwards and onwards um, w w without stopping. Love that. I love that yeah. idea. I mean, something I, I really love about um, those sort of landscape paintings um, is really that there's a conflation between the sort of figure ground relationship that in Western landscape painting, the figure is always sort of central to the image, whereas in, in, in particularly those watercolors, the, there's, there's this sort of balance between the, the landscape and the figure. Um, and, 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 and part of that is the is is the sort of lack of perspective. I've been looking a lot at uh, at Giotto's um, work because, of course, Giotto is positioned right at the beginning of the construction of perspective, and the architectures and the backgrounds to his paintings are the are mismatched to the perspective of the of the figures. So, so there's a mismatch between the perspectival reality of the architecture and the landscape and those of the figures almost like they belong to two different sort of perspectives. And, and I really love those sort of things. I think at this point where we're, we're asking ourselves, how do we not see the anthropomorphic or the anthropocentric, how, how do we facilitate a non-anthropocentric viewpoint? Um, these sort of yeah. questions are so important. Um, like how do we dismantle our single point perspective really? True, and and also it's this this thing, this notion that humans are are they don't they have the same largesse and and grandeur and expansiveness as nature, which we don't. Um, and that and and in fact, I think when we recognize that there is a need to to return to this understanding of nature being as important as us. Um, that's when we will start, maybe also start to see some shifts in, in the, thing, the way things are represented. Um, at, exactly as you said, it's very anthropocentric at the moment and, and we need to sort of move away from that actually. Yeah, it actually reminds me of something I wanted to mention after Mukami spoke because I, I think as much as our sort of uh, sense of identity is tied up in landscape, I, at, at this point I think there's always it's always coupled with this sense of landscape as something of a loss through our sort of ecological awareness. So, so as much as we tie our identity to landscape, we also experience it through an, this immense sense of sort of futility and loss and, 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 a, and a kind of um, inevitability that we, so, so, so you, I think there's a, it's a very complicated thing that the way you tie your identity to landscape, but at the same time experience landscape as a loss. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I think you're naturally leading into, um, and I'm, and I'm conscious of time because I want to have uh, time for questions, but you know, one thing that 
you know, I've been thinking about, Benny's been thinking about, and then when, you know, we were discussing a little bit beforehand is this idea of how um, our mindset and well-being and so on and so forth links into, you know, art spaces. But for us, it's been like art, architecture and music um, and what gets dislodged, right? So, you know, we were talking about this sense of memory, right? When you're walking past a place or, you know, Mukami, you know, the incredible project that has derived from the gathering where there's musicians and they're bringing a sense of community through, through music. Um, and I was wondering whether, yeah, I think that because it's such a core part of Aura, you know, this sense of using art, architecture and music as a conduit for feeling and feeling good, um, that maybe, you know, we could just like think about, I don't know, just think about that for two seconds. Yeah, sure. Um, so in terms of what we'd spoken about before um, and what NKI is trying to achieve during COVID and during this time of, of uncertainty and rupture um, is to show that art can be used as a tool for change and transformation, which is something we started to think about with the gathering. Um, but so what Michael has done um, together with Ayako, who runs NKI, um, so Michael's created a lithograph that he's now um, selling through White Cube and then using the, the funds from that, the proceeds from that, to create a number of um, grants for artists in East Africa, but also to fund the COVID response of this initiative called Ghetto Classics. Mm -hmm. And for me, I think Ghetto Classics is one of the most extraordinary initiatives um, in Nairobi, in that it gives um, children in Korogosho the access to musical instruments and to uh, lessons and to play in, the, the possibility of playing in an orchestra. Um, and so because they're unable to share, um, not all of them can share instruments during COVID, what they're using the funds for is to then create this into like a feeding program um, for the musicians and their families. And I think that whole ethos and thinking about, you know, wellness and how artists can contribute to, you know, fostering a sense of care and well-being in communities is something that's tied into um, the work that, the, that NKI is doing right now. Um, and trying to understand, you know, how it is that one negotiates um, like an art space, but also how the art space negotiates its place within the city itself. Mm. Um, and so yes. with these liminal spaces, which are spaces that are neglected traditionally, such as, you know, uh, underprivileged areas. Um, and I think it's been extraordinary to see what Inkai is trying to achieve um, and, and the, the sort of the similar ethos that exists between, you know, something like, like Iora, which you go into and you, and you hear the most soothing music. So how does it that one creates that similar sense of well-being um, in, in somewhere like Nairobi right now? I think is, is going to be interesting mm -hmm. to watch in the next few weeks and months. Yeah, I, I think so too. I think it's interesting that you brought up the music and I should say, you know, that um, it was thinking about this matching between, you know, artists' work and also the, the, the music that infiltrates the space and, like work like Gerhards where there's all these little layers and there's details and you know for that we brought on board um, uh, an incredible composer called Nico Muli and he created some music and it was just like a perfect matching of this twinkling um, and yeah just a sense of levitation which actually kind of links back even to your work because it has that sense of you know you know levitation is not that, that ungroundedness groundedness um, I was wondering whether anybody has any questions. Um, feel free to unmute yourself and speak up, or you can also ask a question through the chat. I, I just thought I would kind of make one last comment. And Please. That was <laughs> we love comments. <laughs> yeah. in just thinking about this idea of well being and, and it. A state of calm being actually something that is so needed right now. I don't know if most people hear, it, but I have experienced a roller coaster of emotions during this time, in and in of COVID, and kind of to link back to what Mukami was saying at the very beginning, and this idea of uncertainty being like a very pervasive thing that we need to need to deal with all the time, and and I think if COVID has shown us anything that we are constantly really existing in a state of uncertainty. Um, mm -hmm. And and so we like to create the boundaries and the parameters uh, and the structures and the rules that govern us. Our journey through life is actually one where we 
are uncertain and we don't know the end. I mean, bar death, let's say, right? Mm -hmm. We don't know when or where we're going to die. Um, and in realizing and meeting this uncertainty, actually, we allow ourselves to enter a place of, of truly unmitigated potential. Um, and that's how I kind of see Iora as well. Um, you know, Gerhard's work incorporates gestures which mark boundaries or employ elements of classic cartography. Um, and we talked a little bit yesterday about this framing of a space and, and breaking down this representation that we think about the creation of borders, the marking of territories often arbitrary. Uh, and without logic and, and tied to political and geographical agendas. And so mm -hmm. when we break down these, these barriers and boundaries, we allow ourselves um, the ability to view things from multiple perspectives and therefore open ourselves to, to shifts in perception um, and the possibility of understanding people and cultures different from our own. And I think that is like the one takeaway that I had in, in kind of trying to think about where this, this section, where uncertainty and the geographies and the spaces that we're engaging with and from the perspective of art kind of comes to, you know, and, and, and Jen and Benny having created this virtual space, which aims to kind of collapse these traditional methods of experiencing art. Um, you know, we're, we're so adjusted to living in, almost living in two lives, you know, one in the physical world, one in the virtual world. Um, and so in some ways we're already spreading our awareness around into alternative spaces. Um, and so where the difficulty lies, I think, is, is when those experiences inhibit us. Um, so whether that's through the spreading of misinformation, which Kara talked about, or the platforms that allow hatred and race, racism to have a forum. So yeah. we need to kind of dispel those things and, and, and kind of almost like throw them out, really, um, and create the spaces where there is a, 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 a well-being for us as people. Um, yeah. So yeah. Just wanted to end with that. Where well, there's a humanity, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I would, I would, I would, I would say also, I mean, just, just thinking about that humanity. I mean, one of the most beautiful things about humanity is, is a capability for intimacy. Mm -hmm. And you know, one thing that we were talking about <laughs> actually yesterday um, with, with God is the fact that you can get up so close <laughs> to your work that there are no there's no restriction. You can just go up and be so close to it. There's a near tactility to it without, uh, with, but, but it's through eyesight. Um, and I think that's quite, um, that's quite beautiful um, to, to think about because, you know, there's this reorientation, you know, and we've, we've, I mean, I, I would say I've been in the art industry for, you know, decade, primarily private sector, Bianca, um, Mukami previously with, you know, working at, you know, different art fairs, galleries, we can focus on the artist. We can focus on your work, right? And we can talk about that, like repivoting, and um, which is just so important, right? Because at the end of the day, none of us would be here if you were not creating what you're creating. Well, well said to you. But um, what, what was incredible, as you were saying, what was amazing to me um, in walk, kind of walking up to the artwork in your space was that sense, it was almost like a Google Earth sense that you could just zoom in and in and in. And it's in, I think it's really interesting how we take our bodies with us into that virtual space. You almost want to touch the artwork. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and you sort of look with your body in a sense. And um, I think one of the significant things about that moment is that it's, it facilitates a kind of a slow looking and we don't really associate looking online and looking in the virtual with slow looking, with careful looking and with gentle looking. Um, you know, we, we, online space is a space that you flick through and that you whiz past and, yeah. and, 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 and you, you, it's not really that sort of meditative, contemplative, uh, space for 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 looking and and sort of staring yourself out at something, and I think uh, Aura is really interesting on that level, in, in, as an attempt to facilitate a different kind of looking and a different way of sort of spending time in that space, in the virtual space. I love that you say that so much, and I could go on for ages because something I think about a lot is that fine line between seeing and looking, um, hearing and listening. Yeah. And um, those distinctions which relate to a sense of being present. And actually, it loops back to the origin of our name. So, Aora actually derives from Aora, which means now or present in Spanish, which is 
the language Benny and I share other than English. So it all comes back, it all loops, the Mobius loop continues. <laughs> well, there's, there's more really, because um, <laughs> the, the, the exhibition I've got with the Goodman now at the, end, at the beginning of next month is called Near Distant. And so I've been looking into this idea of distance and, and, and engaging with distance as a, as a sort of physical thing. And one of the beautiful writings about distance is Walter Benjamin, who writes about our... Mm. Um, I think the quote, if I say it off my head, is, um, well, I'm not going to quote it, but, but basically he describes how er there's this attempt to bring everything up close. And what is lost in the process is the aura of the object, that, that uh, this incessant in intimacy with things by bringing things up close loses the aura of the thing. And one of the, 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 uh, things he describes aura as is a sense of distance. Mm. And I think there's a beautiful quality about that, that when you see something at a distance, he describes how you see the aura around something, but meaning it's slightly unknown. It's, a, it's not completely within your grasp. It's not yeah. up close. There's a sense of myst mystery about something and a sense of it being unknown. And so the aura is also there. Yes, you've captured, that's really it. Um, we've got one question that came through and I think it's really interesting. It came through privately and it's from, um, from Sarah. Hi, Sarah, thank you. Um, and it was, and, and I'm gonna paraphrase, but you know, there's this temptation no, of- No, I'm sorry. Oh, oh, I don't know what's going on. Um, so the, <laughs> the, the, the question is that there's this temptation of I don't know who's speaking. There's this temptation right now of pushing the World Wide Web, the, the internet as a way, as a democratizing platform. Um, but how do we combat the temptation to negate the existing structures and platforms that exist outside and inside the internet? So I guess like how much can you continue valuing the physical spaces um, while obviously having the, you know, the, the, the internet presence. So I'm just going to quickly answer, but then I think this would be a really interesting question for Mukami to answer, considering the upcoming gathering. Um, yeah. I will just quickly say that, you know, Aura really does not seek to be a replacement. On the contrary, we've collaborated with emerging to establish artists with actual physical galleries. Like the way that I got in touch with, with Gerhard was through his incredible gallery, Goodman, um, you know, who've been incredibly generous in you know in supporting our and the project and we want to exist alongside very crucially there's no replacement it's actually there's a there is, it's a it's another tool for collaboration so maybe it's a way of reaccessing and redriving attention to physical space because galleries live and breathe with people going and stepping inside them mm. um so we want to redirect we don't want to suck you know, or be a replacement for. It. So I think that's that's my place. But like Mukami, I think what you've got coming up with the gathering is so exciting. Um, but just a few things that I was thinking about before in yeah. terms of what the three of you have said. Um, just the way in which like Aura compared to being in a physical space is just a different way of experiencing affect. And you still manage to create this sort of bodily sense of affect despite it being a virtual platform. Um, and so I think for us, it's a question of, we would have loved to have had a physical gathering, but we've moved the gathering online. So the sense of bi-location again, um, and recognizing that with that also does come a sense of freedom and lack of restraint, because for us, the logistics of moving 52 artists from different parts of Africa, where, you know, inter-African travel is extraordinarily expensive, if not just cumbersome. It takes you to get from Nairobi to Casablanca, you'd be on six different flights if you didn't fly to Europe and then fly to Casablanca. Um, and so with, with having the gathering online, I'm interested to see the potential and the possibilities of gathering even more people who possibly couldn't come to the first physical gathering. Uh, but that's to say that it, it's not necessarily going to replace the physical gathering, but it's just going to be a different form of affective um, transformation and gathering together. Um, I think it's still incredibly important to have the physical gathering. I think there's, there's something extraordinarily magical that comes from having all these people together. I think it's Fred Merton, Manolo Callahan, who write about the potential and the agency um, and the role of transformation of, and in the work of gathering and bringing people together. 
Um, and so mm. I think for us, it's a question of just understanding that, you know, having to be in the digital space for now um, in terms of gathering people is, is something that will just be temporary. But I think in the future, I think for Michael and with Kai, um, having met you, Jen, I think he's, there's now a, an, a sense of thinking of how to have both things existing alongside each other, both yeah. virtual and physical, um, in the sense that you can then open yourself up to so many more audiences um, across the world. So I don't think, like you said, it's not necessarily a sense of, of competition between the two or one negating the other, but just sort of finding a way in which they can exist alongside each other. I think it comes back to the sense of nuance, right? And I, I don't know why I'm thinking about this, right? But we have all, actually all of us here, I think I've been really concerned with, you know, diasporic considerations. Mm. And for me, I've always thought about non-UFO effects when it came primarily to organizing a whole series of exhibitions with primarily East Asian artists back over in Europe. And it was like creating a sense of careful matchmaking and connection. And that's what it is. It's creating a, a relationship between spaces, contexts, and, and artists. And I think that this maybe can also apply between the virtual and or like the, the, the digital internet worlds and the real worlds where there's like just a thoughtful matching. Not, not one is plastering the other. There's no like power play. It's literally about how can we be complementing each other? How can we open new discussions? Um, I've noticed there's a question that's come through for, um, for Gerhard. Oh, I mean, and we're admitting someone else in as well. I love how we we're just, we're just going over time. Guys, I know if you need to leave, go, but I think we're, we've got this conversation <laughs> going. Um, Gerhard, do you, see the, do you see the question? No, where am I meant to see the question? It's in the chat group. Um, oh, there, okay. It's asking in this light, I was wondering how you approach these stages of abstraction when working with maps. And there's a really beautiful text that's been written um, above that. Give me one second. Uh, yeah. Notations that are embedded in the maps that we learn to read from a young age, which transform them from images into tools. When you take out the north arrow of a map or the scale bar. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's a beautiful description. I, I'm presuming everyone can see it. I don't need to read the question loudly, right? Yeah, it's to everyone. Yeah, we got, everyone got it. I, I think I can answer the question in a sort of roundabout way because my first interest in working with maps came in 1994, um, which was just after the, after um, our change in government in, in, in South Africa. And, they, and it was sort of 1994, 1995, and we were going through a phase in South Africa where the, the names of places were being changed. And my wife and I used to do these road trips and just travel across the country quite a bit. And we'd have this, I mean, also this was pre-digitization, so we'd have this road map um, that we used to travel with. And suddenly you'd drive around the country and you'd read the map and suddenly the names on the map didn't correlate to the names in the landscape anymore. So there was this disjuncture between the actual landscape and the named landscape and 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 suddenly the, the language around the landscape shifted and so i think that was really my where my interest with um, maps uh, started because that sense of the naming of the thing and the thing itself is a is a sort of interesting philosophical question but of, of course with maps it's it's incredibly pertinent in terms of the sort of the tools and the graphic language, et cetera, of the map, I think what's, what I try to work towards is removing language in the process of, of slicing up the map. So if I have a choice when I sort of fragment the map, if I have a choice to cut through a name and to break up a, a sort of uh, any sense of certainty, I do. And, and in a sense, it feels to me like I'm, splitting up the language, losing the language into a space where I suppose all these, I suppose the urgency of the semiotics that surrounds how we want to try and describe the landscape becomes this um, sort of semiotic soup in a sense, like, like free, I suppose like the postmodern reference to free floating signifiers. If I can sort of loosen them all up, it's, it's almost like I kind of try and create this condensation of the visual language so that 
in a sense, I'm peeling the language off the landscape. And, mm -hmm. and, and so what you're left with, so beautiful. which is why, Bianca, I was so happy to hear that you see the works as landscape drawings, because a, a map is what I would refer to as an indexical object, right? You, you look at the map, but in order to see a different landscape. You look at the map in order to see the landscape. You don't look at the map to see the map. Um, <laughs> and so, so what I make are, are, are these maps. And in the gallery, you, what you're seeing are maps. But what I'm hoping you'd see is the landscape, right? You look at the map to see the landscape. So I'm hoping you see something else. You know, you're in a bilocated position. Um, but, but in this sense, I'm trying to say that if the language becomes so manipulated that, that, that in a sense, the, the landscape can go feral, the landscape can run away. The, the, I'm kind of peeling the, 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 the knownness off the landscape. I don't know if that's any way of describing it, but that's, that's, that would be my answer, is that, is that I'm trying to sort of blow the, the language and the tools of describing the, and controlling and manipulating the landscape into a sort of ecstasy where it explodes, I suppose. <laughs> I love that. That was a very beautiful description. I, I, I really love what you were saying about the maps. No one looks at a map to look at the map. <laughs> yeah, it's really, really good. It's really clear. Yeah, a map is essentially a very self-effacing object, you know? <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. I love that response. Amazing response. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for asking. We, 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 we love questions. Um, so I was wondering if anyone has any further questions. going on one two three. <laughs> is, is, are you putting up your finger benny are we are we in class yeah, i'm just gonna um if i can just say one thing i think that the one of the things that we've kind of all touched on a little bit is idea about slowness and i was also really taken by the idea that geography makes us and we make geography so i guess um the other thing that makes us is landscape. We're inspired by the things that are around us. And I think for everyone, this is probably the first time ever that we've had to, by not by choice, accept a certain slowness. And just to kind of ask an obvious question to, I guess, to everyone on the panel, how has this affected you? And how do you think it might affect your work in the future? Um, particularly as we've had to adapt to living in the virtual. So I think maybe from an artist perspective, Gerhard, maybe you can talk a little bit about that. I don't know if you've had any thoughts. Um, I mean, it's been quite a roller coaster ride. Um, the week before lockdown, I was actually staging a, 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 a performance piece at a national arts festival involving musicians and um, instruments that I've built and things like that. It was very sort of um, far from, from the works we've been discussing. So we were, I was literally in a room working with jazz musicians and, and making sounds, um, you know, jazz musicians making sounds with instruments that I've built. And so it was a very performative, very live space, 60 people in a small space, um, performance and things like that. So going from that back into the studio, which is my ideal sort of working environment, has been a, a, a fantastic space. Certainly a, a big sort of roller coaster um, emotionally and things for all of us. But I think there was a point where one had to realize also that that you you, you could embrace this sort of slowness, that, that there was a sort of meditative aspect to it. And... Um, and that one could really, I mean, I, I really try and work with a sort of meditative approach to my work. And so there was a point where you just had to accept that, you really embrace the moment for, for what it offered. Um, and I think that's been a, a fantastic time. Um, uh, we're very lucky to, in that we made a decision because my wife and I are both artists and, um, um, and, and, and we decided that we didn't want to split our work environment and our living environment. So, so we've got two home studios. So fortunately, our kids are very used to us working <laughs> in the studio. There, there wasn't much that really changed around that. Um, 
And so I'm sitting in my studio right now, but the house is right mm. next door. Um, so, so that's been fantastic. Um, but it, w what's also been beautiful is just how the, the, the sort of meaning in the work changed. Because I've been, I, I was already working on this idea of distance and things like that and sort of collapsing the flatness of the map into the drawing. But suddenly with lockdown, the, the flatness of the map became so sort of symbolic also of the constraints of the moment. And I actually on my Instagram um, uh, account, I, I had a number of works where I, 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 I would post the works and call them fast, space, fast spaces in tight places. Um, and so, so sort of exploding this sort of flatness took on a particular sort of meaning at that, at that stage. And I think that's also what we're engaged with now is a, is a way of sort of exploding the, the confines of the moment. And I think that's been really interesting how one finds community in different ways. Mm. I'm interested in hearing how other people have approached it. I mean, we're very much still in lockdown, so. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so for me, I, I kind of mentioned it before, I had a, a real sort of up and down experience during, during the hardcore lockdown in London. Um, but it also, you know, it, it did, and it still is, I'm still in the state of mind of a really seriously reflective and contemplative state. Um, I worked, I said, I worked for 10 years in, in the commercial art world and though my interests have always been kind of varied, I, I sort of landed on a hamster wheel and didn't realize that I was on it. Um, and, and lockdown and this whole experience showed me that, that there were alternative ways of working. Um, and whether that was just working from home initially or then, you know, leaving my, my previous job and kind of deciding to be freelance and um, kind of more, flexible and agile um that those were those were the things that i was sort of grappling with and and also um it it it, it made it gave me time to think about some of the greater issues that interest me which i had no time to think about so for example um issues that require our attention that uh, that you know organizations that have a social impact so you know hence the reason why i'm working with procreate um and also um working uh, as an ambassador for the tate young patrons um has become a really important kind of part of of my life because as the institution reopens at the end of july we have a big task on our hands which is to ensure that um and, and to be part of the conversation for tate um kind of steering it towards what an institution should be going forward you know when it's been closed for three months and its existence kind of negated by the fact that there are no there is no audience mm -hmm. um and and um so on a personal level it's been a it's been a really transformative time and it has not been easy like it's been there's been weeks where you're thinking you know what's the point? And then there, then, but then it's kind of it, what I, I guess, again, it's this gray area of being, of oscillating between feeling like, oh my God, there's infinite possibilities and oh my God, I'm paralyzed by fear. Um, and so it's just trying to navigate what that, what that space is and, and hopefully lifting yourself to a position where you can actually um, help yourself and help others. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Um, I think I, yeah, I resonate with what you were saying about, you know, being paralyzed by fear. I think that was very much my experience at the beginning of lockdown, just sort of, you know, sensory and informational overload, where you're just watching the news on loop for hours upon hours, uh, which wasn't particularly healthy, but sort of got out of that phase. Um, I think it's, it's been particularly intense for me. I've been on my own entirely, um, which is, you know, circumstances changed. Um, and I think also being far away from my family who are all in Nairobi um, mm. and navigating distance in that way um, has been interesting and challenging, but also watching, you know, watching what's happening in Kenya, sort of trying to figure out what's going on and then them watching what's happening here and them worrying for me. Um, so navigating this sense of having to think about two places and which place you'd rather be in and like having a very long set of calculations that you make when you decide whether to stay or go. Um, so that was particularly tough. Um, but I think the slowness for me has given me the chance to 
um, find or refine or reconnect with communities in different senses, whether that's people working in social justice in Nairobi or artists thinking about um, police brutality, which has been an interesting conversation in the last few weeks. Um, I think in June, there was, or even in May or so, um, there's a lot of people saying that, you know, in Kenya, police brutality since the start of lockdown had killed more people than COVID had. Um, and wow. so talking to, to people about, you know, policing, not only in, in America, but talking about policing in Kenya and, and having the time personally to, to do a lot of, you know, interesting squirrels and, and things that I've been thinking about in terms of the law and history and archives and, and ext ex yeah, um, pulling and excavating these things out of my mind in both like the realms of history mm -hmm. um, to have very urgent conversations. So I think the slowness allowed for, on the one hand, like having the time to think and, and engage with people, but also being able to direct one's energy to some really urgent things happening in the world. Um, it's, yeah, I think it's, it's been a, an interesting time, hopefully transformative for a lot of the institutions uh, in many senses, whether that's on a micro or macro level, um, thinking about, you know, like Bianca was saying, what art institutions will look like coming out of this. Um, yeah, it's been, it's been interesting. I think what all of you are saying really, really deeply resonates. So similar to, you know, similar to <laughs> Bianca, like this was a period where suddenly I started thinking about what is it that I really want to do and what is it I really want to dedicate my energy to because there's a lot of it. And so I was like, so I, you know, after, you know, seven years of being a part of this private gallery um, building their spaces in Hong Kong, Shanghai, then across Europe, um, you know, pitch them a couple of ideas, you know, whether it be, doing something interesting virtually or this, and then realize that actually I'm just going to do it for, my, for myself, but with others. Um, and um, this has been a period to really sit down, focus, and, and, and build. And um, it, it, it made me realize actually how, I, I've always been very, 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 very keen on trying to minimize social noise even though I'm a massive extrovert and I love people, um, just eradicating some of that. And I realized actually how much social noise there was still in my life, um, you know, coming back to London. And now, you know, yeah, focus, focusing and just creating and connecting and not having any fears and connecting, right? Like, I don't know, I, I, I didn't know you, for example, go ahead in person, but I was like, you know what? I feel there's something here. Like, let's, let, let, let's, go, let's go do something. Um, and that's led to a whole bunch of things. Obviously, it's led to Aurora. I also started creating these very short videos um, called Art Bites, where it provides bite-sized information to the contemporary art world. And I created that as a result of like looking at art fairs and being at these art fair online viewing rooms and being like, I just miss that. I mean, I don't miss art fairs, I have to say, but what I do miss is the one minute conversations you would have with people where you're sharing an artwork. Where you're like, mm -hmm. let me give you the down low. <laughs> um, and, um, and then for giggles also launched a podcast. So, you know, it's been fun, it's been productive, but you have to be careful not to get stuck in the dopamine. So, um, you know, I think that's where the slowness comes in. And it's like a lot of yoga, a lot of yoga. <laughs> There simply was a sort of lockdown ecstasy at the beginning mm. where suddenly there yeah. was this proliferation. This guy's DJing every night at five and this and that. And, and now it's kind of settled, I suppose. It's interesting that you should say that ecstasy because a lot of people were asking us, they're like, oh, are you going to do a really big launch for Aurora? Are you going to be like getting this? And we're like, no, no, we're going to release it to a couple of hundred people to start and we're going to let it grow organically because we don't want it to be a flash in the pan. Mm. This is something that we've been thinking about for three years. And it, the, the idea first came to, to me about how to engage art and health when I was in hospital about three and a bit years ago. And we've been slowly building it and thinking it. So actually slowness is deeply embedded in how we've gotten here. And it's also the way that we're trying to share out this, you know, share out this message and what we're doing. Um, yeah, I just thought of that. We had one more quick question that came through and then I will we'll let everyone go. Oh my God, we've gone over by 50, 30 minutes. Um, whether we feel like COVID has changed the definition of public programming. And I think it has. I mean, I'm just going to say quickly, you know, like we're obviously thinking as things ease up, like how we can have more in-person also interactions, but we're not going to get rid of this digital connectivity. I think that, you know, the art world can, you know, could do with a little bit of like adapting to maybe other industries where they've embraced um, 
uh, digital technology, I think of sport primarily where things are pre-filmed and then they're released afterwards. So rather than making it, it can still be, it could, you can think of intimate gatherings that they're still like, digital as opposed to, oh God, it's, this, is, this is something worse for me to do. So that's my, that's my point of view. Um, just in, ter I, um, in terms of public programming, I guess I can speak a little bit to um, what Francis Morris said quite recently. Um, sorry, is there someone? Am I speaking over someone? Someone is. Someone. So actually, let me just quickly say this, and then we can. Um, so Francis, she said in a in a webinar of talking mostly about climate change but also about the reopening of Tate um and one of the most interesting things she said was really that in the past institutions like Tate um uh, have wanted to evolve and they've done it by keeping their existing programming and adding new things and and actually what we should be doing now is readapting and reusing existing structures and connecting with other institutions and other you know entities to adjust and to rediscover the potential of what we have um and i think that is something that will will resonate i think with a lot of public programs you know because lockdown has also put a lot of people in financial trouble yeah. you know institutions are also in financial straits you know and so the ability to to repurpose things that exist already and 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 um really tease the, their full potential out is way more interesting than um just trying to build something new and to, to you know to fit just because that's what we normally do in yeah. you know. um so that that i think is is going to be a an interesting space to watch I think what's interesting is, I mean, I'm thinking now, of, right at the beginning, there was a presidential sort of announcement in our country, and suddenly the informal economy became part of the conversation. And, and, and the informal in economy has never been part of the sort of, has never been formally acknowledged as part of the sort of governmental conversation, neither has the sort of informal transportation systems and things like that. And suddenly the sort of informality became officialized or, or not officialized, became part of the conversation. Yeah. And I think the same will count for our environment. I think art fairs and, 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 and the sort of capitalist systems that, that has run things, it has kind of run away with a lot of the, um, I suppose with the content and with, with what we produce and how we produce. And um, what's been beautiful is how immediately when all those things sort of collapsed or closed down, the emphasis was back with the artist in his studio. And I thought mm. there was a sort of essentializing. That's where the content gets created for the whole industry. But somehow the industry has forgotten about that link. Suddenly there was a sort of wormhole back to the sort of origin of those things. And I think... Amen. It's a similar sort of informality that suddenly, and this kind of informality doesn't need that whole structure for this to happen. And, and, and so suddenly there's a space for kind of smaller things, maybe more fragmented things, more informal things, but or local, maybe more local. grounded local. things. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And a different sense of what local is, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Like a small thing rather than a big thing. Yeah. Even a different sense of what public is, right? Like, you know, Jen thinking about something we talked about two weeks ago, um, the South Bank project, right? Where they're projecting all these artworks onto the outside of the gallery. And how do you take the gallery into a wider sense of what public means? Um, is something that I've been thinking about and, and sort of watching institutions coming to terms with how to engage the public and, and, and the, the extent to which sort of galleries are at the forefront of, of figuring that out, whether that was through having open studios um, and various forms of engagement, whereas, you know, I think it, it's taken a while for museums to catch up, which is, again, due to a number of constraints that they have. Uh, but I mean, watching something like the programming of and around um, Love is a Message, the Message is Death, the Arthur Jacob film, and seeing how institutions were able to partner with each other around the world, institutions that held that work. Um, I think it is, it is, COVID is definitely changing um, how it is that we think about public programming. 
um, mm. and the extent to which these works, which wouldn't necessarily previously be shown on, on the internet, like works you think about as being held in a collection and being prized in this very specific way, are now being shared on the internet for a weekend and you have that being opened up to the audiences. Um, I think it, it is a time for transformation, and hopefully um, for, for reorientation of a lot of how institutions think about what the public means and looks like. Yeah, and sparking thought. I mean, I am now leaving this conversation with so many further thoughts. <laughs> I feel like my adrenaline has really risen. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think I, I think we can um, we can safely say that we've really extended <laughs> our time. I just wanted to close off, Gerhard. You've got a show that's upcoming, right? Yes. 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 It's um, it's in Johannesburg. Am I correct? Yes, it's in Johannesburg. Obviously, we don't know to what extent it'll be physical, <laughs> um, but but it'll be there. It'll be in, this, in 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 Johannesburg, but it'll have a strong sort of online component and Amazing. virtual component. So so hopefully that'll be strong. Um, the show is called Near Distant, um, and um, it opens on the eighth of August. Amazing. So I guess everyone, you know, we've all been brought here by different wonderful people by different means. But, um, you know, we do encourage you to visit, um, obviously, um, ourspace.com, uh, which is where you can visit the space, share it with your friends, share it with your family. It's open to all and every one of you. Um, and if you want to, you know, find out more about, um, you know, Oh, we want someone else coming back in. If you want to find out more about, um, you know, Gerhard's practice, you can obviously um, find out more through through Goodman Gallery or his website or your Instagram and eat and, and Bianca's Instagram and you know, <laughs> and Mukami's. Um, so I think we're all here. We all want to connect with every one of you. And if you have questions later, please don't hesitate. You've got the info at aurorspace.com email, um, and we'll pass it on to each relevant person. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you so much. And thanks to everyone for participating in this conversation. What an honor to be part of this conversation. Yeah, and participating and, 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 and participating and persisting because I, I thought this was going to be an hour. But no, we are here an hour and a half later. <laughs> that just shows you when, you know, when, 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 when connections going, it keeps on going. And yeah, everyone, you're such a delight. So thank you all. Thank you so thank much. You. Bye. Bye. Bye.